very good morning friends so i welcome you all to the ca final financial reporting classes and uh, today we are starting with the very first topic with you and that is inventories in days 2 so i thought it's better to start with a little simpler topic where you have already done something similar in terms of accounting standard 2 and we going to get exposed to some more uh, nitty gritties as far as inventory standard is concerned so i am going to first of all share with you the text of the standard as well and in the text of the standard i think the first thing you know what comes to my mind is to tell you that you can see that there is certain paragraphs which are italicized like for example the para number 1 which is italicized and you can see the para number 2 which is in little bold format i think before i start picking up the standard let me tell you the bold portion is supposed to be the text of the standard and the italicized portion is supposed to be the explanation to the bold paragraphs so as we read along with these particular standards i think we need to keep that also into mind that when you read any paragraph which is bold it is indicating that that is the main text of the standard and the italicized portion below that would be giving you an explanation now when i start with any standard for that matter you know that's what i keep in mind and i would also tell you that you should also have a similar concept at the back of the mind the very first thing you should do is concentrate on the name of the standard Now, when I'm looking at India's two, the first focus is the name of the standard is inventories. So we would first of all spend a little time understanding that what is inventory. So I'm looking at first of all the para number six, where we're given the definition of what is inventory. So let me just read the definition to you. I think I'll zoom it a little further as well. so you can see that the para number 6 defines that inventories are assets and you know when i look at the definition that inventory are assets my focus before anything else turns on the word that we're looking at the word assets so why are you looking at such a you know a significantly to the word assets i'll tell you something very interesting like for example when we go to go to india 16 which talks about property plant equipment we all know that ppe is reflected on the asset side of the balance sheet but if you read the definition of a property plant equipment you will see that the word written is they are tangible items nowhere in the definition of a property plant equipment they use the word assets now you would say that even if the word asset is not used how does that make a difference i'll i'll tell you you know when you look at the word assets the word assets has to be seen with reference to the definition which is given in the framework for preparation and presentation of financial statements don't get worried on the notes you know i'll first of all elaborate the concept so you need not do any notings for the time being then after we have understood the concept then i'm going to make some notes also to you so no worries you can just relax and hear you know the interpretation first So as I said if you look at the word assets the definition of the word assets is given in the framework for preparation and presentation of financial statements and I think if I'm not looking at the exact definition there are two major things which one would look at when you say that an item is an asset number 1 we need to first of all prove that there is going to be a future economic benefits and it should be probable that means there is more likely or you can say a more than 50% chance that future economic benefits would arise and the second parameter for the asset is that we should be able to prove a control factor the control factor means that there is either a legal ownership or there is a right to restrict the others from the use of the asset which means if you want to prove that an item is inventory you need to first of all prove that it is an asset and as i said if you want to prove that it is an asset 
then in that particular case you need to prove the two parameters number one that there is a future economic benefits which is probable and number two we should be able to prove that there is a control i know what you're thinking you're thinking, sir, can we have an example which would illustrate this particular concept? Okay, let me share a small little example also with you. I remember I had seen one particular question a couple of years back also, which came in the exams, I think, in CA final. Then the same question came in CA inter, but that was, of course, in the old course. But that doesn't make a difference because largely at least the definition of what inventories are is same in terms of AS2 as well as in India's 2. So there was a very interesting example, you know, which said that let's say there is a particular restaurant. So they said there is a particular restaurant, you know, which is basically in the business of selling beer bottles to the consumer. It is in the business of selling the beer bottles to the consumer. Now what happens? The customer comes to the restaurant and then he consumes the beer. But what he does, he leaves the empty bottles of these beer in the restaurant. So basically the focus is that the restaurant is engaged in terms of selling beer bottles. But these empty bottles are left by the consumer in the restaurant itself. Now, what were the facts given in the question was that the consumer leaves those empty bottles and these are taken in the position. The restaurant takes a position of these particular bottles with them. And then, you know what the restaurant does? It actually, you know, invites tenders. And by inviting tenders, then they make a sale of these empty bottles. So these were the two major facts which were given in the question that, you know, the restaurant takes the possession of these bottles and then it invites tenders and sells these particular bottles. The question which was asked in the exam was that is this empty bottle to be considered as an inventory or not? The examiner straightforward said that do you think it is an inventory or not? Now, if one were to answer this particular question, I'm sure what we need to first of all decide is that is it an asset or not? Because unless it is an asset, I cannot fulfill the parameters of the definition of inventory. So in this particular case, I guess if I make my analysis and as I said, I need to prove that it is supposed to be an asset, then I think I'm looking at the two parameters one is that i'm looking at future economic benefits would arise and that should be probable in nature that means there is more than a 50 percent chance that the future economic benefits would arise and number two we should be able to prove the control factor as well now let us relate the facts of the case and see are these two factors getting satisfied or not I think at the first instance, you know, when we're looking at that the restaurant is inviting tenders to send these empty bottles, I think some way or the other, the level of materiality is quite indicative. You'll agree that, you know, if a restaurant is inviting tenders to sell empty bottle, I mean, it would be certainly an amount which is material in nature. And if it is material in nature, I think it automatically proves the concept that future economic benefits would arise. And inviting tenders would also mean that it is probable in nature. So which means the fact of the case which says that we are inviting tenders would indirectly give me the input that the future economic benefits are going to be probable in nature. And similarly, if I'm looking in terms of the control factor, the key word which is given in the facts is that the restaurant took a possession of these empty bottles. Now, if they took a possession of these empty bottles, I think we can certainly also say that it proves a control factor as well. Because you see, in this case, there is no need to prove a legal ownership. But I guess the moment the restaurant takes the possession of the bottle, I'm sure it is able to restrict the use of these empty bottles by anybody else. 
So I think with these factors, one would zero down on the fact that yes, it is certainly an asset. I never said it's an inventory. I just said that these empty bottle is an asset. And in fact, you know, the best part was that the question had two requirements in it. The first requirement was he was asking us that is it an asset? And then he said, if it is an asset, then is it an inventory? So I think we have proved the first part that yes, it is an asset. Once you prove that it is an asset, then I think I need to prove whether it is an inventory or not. Now, when you say that it is an inventory, apart from the fact that it is an asset, then you need to fulfill the other aspects of the definition. Now, when I need to fulfill the other aspects of the definition, my mind takes me back on the definition itself. So I think now we can understand the key word when I say that inventories are assets. Then if you read, it says A, B or C. That means these assets are required to fulfill any one of the three parameters. If you look at the first one, it says it is held for sale. The key word is sale. It is held for sale in the ordinary course of business or it is in the process of production for such sale, what we you know, technically call a WIP. Or it says it is in the form of material, where we say it's raw material, or supplies to be consumed in the production process or in the rendering of services. So in simple words, we've always you know, knew that A is making a reference to finished goods, what we call FG. B is making a reference to WIP. And C is making a reference to the raw material and the supplies to be consumed in the production process. So that means any one of these parameters need to be met in the given example as well. Now, I think if I come back to my example and I ask, you know, which parameter is getting met, I would say that these empty bottles are being kept for the purpose of sale. Now, one particular challenge, you know, what can come to the mind is, so but it is not a sale in the ordinary course of business. The business of the restaurant seems to be selling beer bottles. And in this particular case, they are selling empty bottles and not the beer bottle. So can we really say that it is a sale in the you know, ordinary course of business? But we all know that you know, when we are into a particular business, the main business and incidental activities related thereto are all a part of the business. So I think we cannot preclude the fact that, you know, if he's selling empty bottle, we cannot say that it's not a part of the business. Agreed. The main business would be selling beer bottle. But I think as a, you know, extension of the main business, selling those empty bottles would also be an incidental activity. So I think we can certainly prove that it is a sale undoubtedly in the ordinary course of business as well. So I think once we've fulfilled, fulfilled all these parameters, number one, saying that it is supposed to be an asset. And secondly, also saying that it is supposed to be a sale in the ordinary course of business. I think we've decided finally that yes, it is supposed to be an inventory. I'm pretty sure this would have changed your perception in terms of looking at the definition of the word inventory as well. The idea is that we should not only be able to understand the definition, but apply it in a practical situation as well. So I think the model of the story, the model of the story now is going to be that once we've made these particular inputs, so once you've made these particular inputs, I think what I'm going to do, I am now going to make some notes with you. You know, we've read the definition of the word inventory. Let's, I think, once have a look once again, and then we'll make some notes on the definition of inventory. So as I said, that whenever you face any particular standard, your key focus should always be to, you know, first of all, look into that the topic which you're studying, let's say if it is inventory, you should focus on what is inventory. When you're looking in terms of a property plant equipment, your focus should be what is property plant equipment. Focus on the key name of the standard. Because there is no fun even in terms of looking at the scope of the standard. Because in those particular cases, we cannot appreciate the scope unless we really know the meaning of the, you know, the terminology itself. 
So I think let's have a look once again on the definition. And we can see it clearly says inventories are assets. So I'm sure next time when you read the word assets, you know the focus points where it is going to be. Held for sale in the ordinary course of business, which is finished goods. In the process of production for such sale, which is a WIP, which is going to be converted into FG and then it is going to be sold again. Or it says in the form of materials or supplies to be consumed in the production process. Now, there are a couple of clarifications which were, you know, issued by the Institute of Chartered Accountants. And some of these clarifications came, you know, in the education material. And as I've already made a promise to you that we're going to do a relevant questions picked up from each and every source. So what I've also done, I've also organized, you know, the questions which we're going to cover in terms of each and every index. And you can see that when I'm covering these particular questions, you can clearly see that you will see the focus in terms of the subheadings. When we're looking at the definition, then the para number is there. And if there is any additional para, like you can see the para number six, we'll be focusing on the definition. But then there is a para number eight as well. And I've put a small little question, which is based on para number eight. So I think before I read that particular question, I think I need to take you to the para number eight as well. Then I think we'll make some consolidated notes based on the definition of inventory. So let me just come back to the text of the standard and have a look at what para number eight has got to tell me. It says in para number eight that inventories encompass goods purchased and held for resale. The focus is goods purchased. That means we're focusing on the concept that it is supposed to be a tangible item. But let me tell you that even intangible items can be inventory. You know, when you say that inventory or asset, it does not mean that they would always be a tangible assets. It can be a tangible or it can be an intangible assets both. Now, for example, I am a software dealer. Then in that particular case, you know, I am basically dealing with intangible items. It can be inventory for me because I'm dealing with those intangible items. They're held for sale in the ordinary course of business. So para number eight tells me that inventories encompass goods purchased and held for resale. For example, a merchandise purchased by a retailer and held for resale, land and other property held for resale. You know, certain items which might be non-current assets for the buyer, but of course for a seller, it becomes something which is inventory. So I might be selling items which are current assets for the other party. I might be selling items which are non-current assets for the other party. But at the end of the day, it is supposed to be inventory for me. Then he says inventory also encompass the finished goods produced, the WIP which is being produced. And then the focus is materials and supplies awaiting use in the production process. Now, the clarification, you know, which the Institute gave in the education material was the focus on the word material. Now, you know, when we look at the word material, the main question what comes to the mind is that material means raw material. But are we looking for something else as well? The question is, what about a packing material? When we use the word material in the definition of inventory in clause C of para number six, are we looking at, you know, the packing material as well? Are we also looking at the advertisement material which the company is dealing in? So there was a very interesting clarification which was given by the Institute. And I think that's what it talks of. If you look at the question number one, don't worry, I'm going to make an answer for that. It says, para number eight says that inventory includes materials and supplies awaiting use in the production process. Whether a packing material and a publicity material are covered by the term materials and supplies awaiting use in the production process. Well, I think let me first of all tell you the guidance which was given in the education material. You know, they segregated the packing material in terms of two sections. They said one is a primary packing and they said the second is what you call a secondary packing. 
Now let me explain, you know, what a primary and a secondary packing is, but maybe I think your mind is working on the concepts you have done in indirect taxes, and I think if you're thinking on those lines, it's perfectly correct. You know, when I'm looking at a primary packing, for example, I'm looking at, let's say, selling medicines. Naturally, there would be some basic kind of packing without which I cannot sell my product. And that's a primary packing. You cannot sell your product without a basic level of packing. Now, that primary packing is certainly a part of the inventory. So if a company has got a primary packing material, which is held as, you know, held with you at the end of the year, it is certainly inventory under India's too. But the institute also clarified that if you're looking in terms of a secondary packing, if you're looking in terms of secondary packing, then in those particular cases, it is not inventory because that is more in the nature of, you know, an advertisement cost. Like if you see during the seasons, you know, when there is a lot of festivity, so during the festive seasons, you know, companies do some additional kind of packing to make it more attractive to the consumer. So any kind of secondary packing material is not inventory. That would be considered as a revenue expenditure. Similarly, when it said that publicity material, the publicity material would also be considered to be an advertisement cost. So they made it very clear that when you're looking at materials, then when your mind is working on, you know, the packing material, we say if it is primary packing, yes. If it is secondary packing, no. And if it is a publicity material, no. I think now it's time to do some documentation as well. Because I think whatever we have discussed, I think we need to make some key notes to you. So let's do one thing. Let's, I think, start with the very first section. So I'm going to put this as number one. And I'm going to put this as what is inventory. So the focus is what is inventories. It's not a singular word. It's a plural word. It talks about what is inventories. Now, as we said, the key focus word is inventory or assets. So I think I'm putting that word assets in capital words. And I think let me also circle it out that the focus comes on the word assets now when i look at the word assets what comes to the mind is that there are two parameters in terms of assets one is that we should be able to prove that future economic benefits will arise and of course we should be able to prove that it is probable in nature the word probable means in terms of percentage that it is 50 percent plus it's not 50 it is 50% plus. So there should be a 50% plus probability of future economic benefits arising. And the second is that we should be able to prove the control factor. Now, when you prove the control factor, either you prove a legal ownership. So either we prove that there is a legal ownership or we are able to prove that we can restrict others we can restrict others from use. So either of the two parameters would take care of the parameter of control. So that's what it should come to your mind. And immediately you should be able to correlate as well the example of the empty bottles as well. So we said these are assets. And then we can divide that these assets have been segregated into three categories. One is we can say it is FG. I hope I can use that short word FG that is finished goods and the brackets. Let's put the focus held for sale. So that keywords held for sale will keep giving us a focus that we're looking at the key term held for sale or it is a WIP and the brackets I can say which is going to be converted. This is going to be converted into FG. It is going to be converted into FG for sale. So ultimately, you're going to sell that WIP after conversion into finished goods. And the focus number three is in terms of raw material, in terms of raw material and supplies, raw material and supplies to be consumed. 
So we're looking at the raw materials and the supplies to be consumed. And I guess apart from the concept of the raw material, we're also adding on a little input further as a clarification. So let me make a small little clarification chart as well. So since we discussed the inputs, so let's make a small little clarification chart also in this case regarding the three kinds of material which we were discussing. So we can outrightly decide A, we're looking at primary packing material. B, we're looking at secondary we're looking at secondary packing material and number three we are also looking in terms of the publicity material so we're also looking in terms of the publicity material and we say primary packing material is inventory but secondary as well as the publicity material is not supposed to be inventory so I hope I have been able to document all what I said with regard to the definition of inventory. Now I think that's going to be really great. You must be thinking almost for the last, uh, I guess, 20 minutes or so, or maybe 20, 25 minutes, I've been just making a background in terms of what is inventory. Trust me, we should always spend a good time understanding the name or the standard. It helps a lot. Trust me, when we're going to come to, you know, something like India's 115, when I look at the name of the standard revenue arising from contract with customers, I'm going to pick up each and every word and spend a good time. I'm going to first of all pick up the word revenue, then I'm going to pick up the word contract, then I'm going to pick up the word customer and try to understand that when we say the word revenue arising from contract with customer, what does each term mean? Because we would not be able to appreciate the largest standard without appreciating the basic terminology, you know, on the basis of which the standard has been built. And, you know, once you start understanding the correct interpretation of the standard, you start developing a interest in the subject as well. I am a very strong believer of the fact that your interest in the subject always comes, you know, when you are able to clarify your doubts when you're able to understand the subject in a logical manner. You know, if you don't understand a subject in a logical manner, you start getting frustrated. And when you start getting frustrated, it culminates into a hatred towards a subject. But I'm sure we're going to make the subject interesting, educating, of course, for you, so that you develop a passion towards the subject. I know some people, of course, would have passionate towards you know taxation or towards law but i think at the end of the day when you are studying as a student you need to be passionate towards each and every subject because at the end of the day we need to get marks on every subject but of course the core specialization of course would turn into your own area of interest okay so now with these inputs i think the first part is done where i have given you what is inventory now the key inputs in the standard is pertaining to the measurement of inventory. If you look at the focus in terms of India's 2, the focus in terms of India's 2 is on the measurement of inventory. Let me have a look at the para number 9, which deals with the concept of measurement of inventory. If you read the para number 9, it says inventories shall be measured at the lower of cost and net realizable value. You know, we all know this principle. We've heard this umpteen number of times since the days of foundation that inventories are measured at the lower of cost and the net realizable value. You know, but when, when, I, when I look at the para number nine, you know what comes to my mind is when it says inventories, We've just seen in the definition in para 6 that inventories would mean finished goods, WIP, as well as raw material. So does para number 9 apply to all those three inventory? Is para number 9 applicable to FG, WIP, as well as raw material? And the answer is no. When you look at the measurement principles in terms of India's 2, 
You need to read this para number 9 along with another para and that is para number 32. I know you must be also feeling a little scared. Sir, you are taking the para numbers with an ease because you might have taught this standard a couple of number of times. But should we be able to remember these paras and all? Well, I don't see that there should be a need to remember any para numbers. But I would still request and a little bit insist as well that there are certain para numbers in each standard which are important. Like for example, in this standard, you may not talk in terms of para 6, the definition. But I think you should certainly focus on the para number 9 and the para number 32. Because since we look at inventory, the main thrust of the standard is what? Measurement principle, which is laid down in the standard. So I think if you remember the para number 9 and 32, good enough. But even if you can't do that, I don't see any challenge in that particular case. So as I said, When I'm looking in terms of the measurement principle of inventory, I need to read para number 9 along with para number 32. So let me do one thing. Let me take you to the para number 32 as well. Now, if you look at the para number 32, you'll see something very interesting in the initial wordings. And I think I want you to read those highlighted words very carefully. It says material and other supplies held for use in the production of inventory. Isn't that the clause number C in the definition in para number 6? Have a look at it carefully. Isn't that supposed to be the clause number C in terms of the definition when it said that material and other supplies held for use in the production? So, para number 32 is giving you the measurement principles in terms of material and other supply. So, para number 9 is applicable only to finished goods and it is applicable only to WIP. Para number 9 is not applicable to raw material and other supplies. For raw material and other supplies, we need to basically apply the concept of para number 32. Now let's see what para number 32 has to tell us. He says material and other supplies held for use in the production of inventory is not written down below cost. It says they are not written down below cost if, the word is if, the finished products in which they will be incorporated are expected to be sold at or above cost. You know, if you try to interpret the language of para number 32, it is indirectly telling us that valuation of the raw material depends upon the valuation of the FG. You know, when it says it is not written down below cost if the FG is expected to be sold at or above cost. Now, if the FG is expected to be sold above cost, that means what? That the FG's NRV is greater. You know, if you just try to look at the chain of thought, when you say that the FG is expected to be sold above cost that means the fg is got an net realizable value which is more than the cost so your fg is going to be measured at cost now he says this raw material which is to be you know consumed in the production of this fg i don't need to sell that raw material the focus in para number 32 is we're looking at those raw material which are held for use in the production not held for sale so when we say that this raw material is not to be sold on a separate basis, it is to be consumed in the manufacture of the finished goods. Now, if I know that my finished goods can be sold above cost, then I think there is nothing risky. So INDES 2 allows me that if your finished goods are measured at cost, the raw material can conveniently be measured at cost. So indirectly we're saying that the valuation of the raw material depends upon the valuation of the finished goods. 
that also adds another very important input. You know, when a company is going to measure, let's say the question gives you that measure the inventory, he says, calculate the value of the closing stock or material and the FG. You should never calculate the valuation of the material first. You should always calculate the valuation of the FG first. Reason? The valuation of the raw material depends upon the FG valuation. So whenever you see a question where he's asking you to calculate the closing stock of raw material, your focus would be, let me first calculate the FG valuation because the raw material valuation depends upon the FG valuation. Now, this is one case that if the FG is valued at cost, the raw material will be taken at cost. But what if the FG is taken at NRV? It says further, when a decline in the price of material indicates that the cost of FG exceeds the NRV, that means the FG will be taken at NRV. The materials are written down to NRV. So he says if the FG is valued at cost, the raw material is taken at cost. If the FG is valued at NRV, then we should bring down the raw material to NRV. Now, there is another interesting thing. You know, when we use the word net realizable value, the word net realizable value is in terms of what are you going to get by selling it? What are you going to get by selling it? But this raw material is not going to be sold. So how can you get the net realizable value for a raw material? So the standard further puts it, in such circumstances, the replacement cost of the material is the best available measure of NRV. So what is the moral of the story? I think if I just try to put a crux to the para number 9 as well as the para number 32, you know what comes to my mind is something like this. I think let me, let me say something and I think you can vouch me on that. My mind is now working on the measurement principle something like this. I would say that if you're looking at FG and WIP valuation, I'm looking at para number 9 cost or NRV, whichever is less. But if you're looking at the measurement of raw material, then I'm looking at the valuation of the FG. The valuation of the FG would decide the valuation of the raw material. If the FG is valued at cost, the raw material is taken at cost. If the FG is valued at NRV, the raw material is taken at cost or replacement cost, not NRV cost or replacement cost, whichever is less. Now you would say, so what is a replacement cost? Well, a replacement cost is that if I were to buy this material, raw material today, what is the price at which I'm going to buy? That is what you call replacement. So if I want to procure more material today, what is the price at which I'm going to procure? Because material is not held for sale. It is held for consumption. So you need to find out that what do you pay today to acquire it. So I think let's do one thing. We're now on the second focus in terms of this index. So let's give a second heading and make a chart based on the measurement. And you know, the moment in this measurement aspect, you start looking at the keywords that it is measured at cost or NRV. A lot of other concepts will unfold. What is cost? What is included in the cost? What is excluded from the cost? What is NRV? What are the basic principles or the guidance factor in terms of determining the NRV? So naturally, after the measurement principle, our focus will turn to the section number three, cost. What is included and excluded in cost? Are there any specific cost formulas which are to be used in terms of cost? Then the fourth section would focus in terms of NRV. That what is NRV? And we will see the parameters, the guidance which is to be taken in terms of calculating the NRV. And as the once the inventory is written down, is there a reversal of the NRV which is allowed or not? 
So trust me, there are total four sections. And you know, it is very important to move in a standard in a very canonical manner. So that, you know, if you're sitting, let's say, relaxed in your mind and you want to take a quick revision of this index with you, then you should be able to make an assessment. Okay, I started off with the concept, what is inventory? Then I moved to the focus on the measurement principle of inventory, where we talk in terms of cost NRV. Then the third focus was in terms of cost, what is taken, what is not taken, what are the cost formulas. Then the fourth focus in terms of NRV, what is NRV, what is the distinction of NRV with a fair value, what are the parameters, the guidance which is to be taken in terms of determining the NRV. And we're also looking in terms of is the reversal of the write-off which is done allowed or not. And trust me, with these four sections, you get taken care. But you know, it's it's like, you know, when you are served with a pizza, there is a base pizza, but then in that base pizza, you can add on a few things as well. And we're going to add on a few things in between these sections as well. So when you're going to talk in terms of cost, we'll talk of some special agendas in terms of cost. Where we're going to talk in terms of joint and byproducts. We're going to talk in other terms, in terms of another special agenda. Let's say the inventory is acquired on a deferred settlement terms. So, but we're going to organize this standard in a very phased manner. So, that you know, everything gets binded in the mind. And I would also request that if you want to get a good grip on the subject, and on each and every Indias, what you need to do religiously, whatever we study in a particular day, please revise that on the same day before you go for the next class. And once the topic gets completed, you know, you must take a cumulative revision as well. That means if I'm spending, let's say, two or three classes on Indias 2, I'm just taking an example. So you should also then, after the topic gets over, revise all three classes with you. Because you know what happens? In the initial standards, you will not face much problem. Because even if you don't revise, because you've done that at the intermediate levels. But what happens when you're doing a new standard, there are certain things which, you know, will give you more clarity as we go ahead with the standard. So once you come to the later part of the standard, you are able to get the complete picture of that standard. So please do a daily revision, that's one. And please do a cumulative revision at the end of each standard. And trust me, you don't need to refer any other material in terms of revision, because in the material which I'm going to share with you, you're going to get extensive, all the questions covered from all the possible sources. As I said, you look at the educational material, you look at the study material, you look at the past examination questions, you look at the index bulletins, you look at the RTPs, you look at the MTPs, every source of material relevant for you is already there. Okay, so I am going to, of course, you know, keep insisting you for this kind of revisions as well. So let's do one thing now. We're going to make some notes on the measurement concept. And I think let me divide this measurement into two parts. We said we're looking at the measurement of FG or we're looking at the measurement of WIP or we're looking at the measurement of material and supplies. We're looking at material and other supplies. So as I said, if you can, you can remember the para number. So at least in the notes, I'm going to add the para number. This is based on para number nine. And this is based on the para number 32. So if you look at the concept of para number nine, we need to measure the inventory at cost or NRV, that's net realizable value, whichever is less. And when you're looking at the material, we can say the valuation depends upon, it depends upon the finished goods valuation. It depends upon the finished goods valuation. So we can say when we say that it depends upon the finished goods valuation, I think let's put it something like this. That if you say that the finished goods is valued at cost, the finished goods is valued at cost as per para number nine, undoubtedly the raw material is valued also at cost. 
So raw material is also valued at cost. And the moment you say that the finished goods is valued at NRV, if you say the finished goods is valued at net realizable value, that is NRV, then we can say the raw material is valued at cost or I'm putting it as RC. You know, RC is the replacement cost, whichever is less. So are we also going to cover up the practical illustrations on these particular issues? Undoubtedly, yes. It's not that I'm going to teach you only the theoretical concepts. The assignment which I've shared with you, of course, is going to be done at my end. So I think let's do one thing. Let's, I think, take you to the question where we can apply this concept as well. So question number one, I've already covered. A few questions I have put, but I may not cover those questions because uh, I wanted to put a collection of all the questions which are there at various sources. But certain questions which I feel may not be very relevant from the examination point of view, I would like, you know, give them to you for extra reading for those who want to get a little more uh, expert on the subject, you know, could do some additional questions as well. So certain questions, I'm going to leave it to you for your extra reading as well. Now, let me have a look at the question number 10, which is based on the measurement principle. And you can see that we are covering the aspect where we are looking at the questions which are based on para number 9 and the para number 32. Now, let's have a look at the question number 10. This is a question which is given in the study material. In fact, the questions where the source is not mentioned, you know, invariably will be from the study material or if they are from any other source, I'll let you know. Because for all the questions, you know, I have actually given the inputs that is it RTP, is it MTP, whatever. It says UA purchased raw material at 400 rupees a kg. Company does not sell raw material company does not sell raw material but uses it in the production of fg i think now you can make complete sense the para number 32 is talking in terms of those material which are used in the production process so he's very clearly said that the company does not sell raw material but it uses it in the production of fg the finished goods in which raw material is used are expected to be sold at or below cost. It says the finished goods in which raw material is used are expected to be sold below cost. I think it's a clear-cut indication of telling you that the finished goods will be valued at NRV. Look at the language carefully. The finished goods in which the raw material is used is expected to be sold below cost. So the NRV of the FG is below the cost. So by virtue of para number 9, the FG will be taken at NRV. And if the FG is taken at NRV, then I think we know that raw material will be taken at cost or replacement cost, whichever is less. Let's read further. At the end of the accounting year, the company is having 10,000 kgs of raw material in inventory. As the company never sells the raw material, it does not know the selling price of the material and it cannot calculate the net realizable value of the raw material for valuation of inventories at the end of the year. And we said we don't need the NRV because there is no concept of NRV related to raw material. However, the replacement cost is 300 per kg. How would you value the raw material? You know, if you look at this particular question, one would easily decide. I think let me give a reference out here. Then when you go to practice this particular section, you must make a reference to question number 10 of the assignment. Now, if you look at this particular question, you know, anybody would easily answer. And, you know, one would get a little more excited in the exam also. Oh, I know this. Since the FG is taken at NRV, the raw material is taken at 400 or 300, whichever is less. So 300 per kg into 10,000 kgs, done. Knowing the concept is definitely important, but presenting that concept is, I think, all the more important as well. Now, in this particular question, I think one thing is pretty clear that if I were to just give you the basic conclusion and move ahead, I would say that we are considering the cost 400 
or we are considering the replacement cost 300 whichever is less so the valuation is going to take place at 300 rupees a kg but i guess when you're going to present such an answer in the examination i think you need to first of all tell the examiner you know the notes what we've made above you should rather first of all tell the examiner in terms of what is the measurement principles laid down in parent number 9 and 32 so you should divide your answer i would say in three parts in the first part you should tell the examiner that what is the guidance given in parent number 9 and in terms of parent number 32 which governs the measurement principle now, after that, you should go to the parent number two, you know, uh, part number two of the answer and relates the facts of the question with these para. Tell them that the facts tells me very clearly that FG is going to be taken at NRV, which implies the raw material is to be taken at cost for replacement, cost which is less. And then finally, in a third part, give a conclusion. So I would say that in such kind of case studies, your answer should always be drafted in like three parts. The first part is devoted to what does the Inde say on that issue. The second part is correlating the facts of the case with those inputs which the standard states. And finally, in terms of the third part of the answer, give a conclusion. Never start your conclusion with the you know, first go. Don't tell the examiner, oh, inventory is taken at 300 rupees. So you need to give him the answer in, you know, three designed parts, I would say. Okay, so this, I think, takes care of another aspect in terms of inventory. And now I'm going to take you further, as I said, to the aspect of cost and to the aspect in terms of energy. So I think let's first concentrate on the concept of cost. So if I'm looking in terms of cost, then my mind is working on what is included in cost. What are the cost formulas, if any? So I think let me draw your attention now to the para number 10. And you can see the para number 10 is focusing on the word cost of inventory. Let's, I think, read and then we'll make a framework. Now, if you look at the para number 10, it very clearly tells you that the cost of inventory shall comprise number one, cost of purchase, number two, cost of conversion, and number three, other cost incurred in bringing the inventory to present location and condition. I think we can clearly see something very interesting and that is that when you're looking at the cost of inventory, there are a total of three costs to be considered. One is the cost of purchase. Now, what is a cost of purchase? We will get into details. Then he says the cost of conversion. And I think you know with your knowledge on cost accounting at the intermediate level, that conversion cost is labor and overheads. And then it says the third cost, that is the other cost, which is incurred in bringing the inventory to present location and condition. I see some key words like location and condition. Don't worry, we'll come to those words. Right now, I have a little different focus. I think I'm just going to quickly run through the cost of purchase. I'm going to quickly run through the cost of conversion. I'll come back to the cost of purchase again. But my focus right now is on the conversion cost because I need to elaborate certain inputs to you in a little more detail at this stage. Let me do one thing. Let me just quickly first run through the cost of purchase with you. It says the cost of purchase comprise of the purchase price, import duties and other taxes other than those subsequently recoverable by the entity from the taxing authorities. You know, we'll make a wonderful chart where we will see that what is included in the cost of purchase, but we can clearly see the purchase price is one, the import duties is another, 
other taxes, but in the other taxes, he gives you a very clear cut clarification that it should not be recoverable from the taxing authorities. Like, for example, if you're paying a GST on the raw material, then we sometimes get an input credit as well. Now, if you're going to get an input credit on that, then that particular input credit means that it is subsequently recoverable from the taxing authority. So if you were to get an input credit on GST, you cannot take it as a part of the cost of purchase. And then it says transport and handling and other cost directly attributable to the acquisition. There could be loading charges. There could be unloading charges. So these are all costs which is directly attributable to acquisition. Then he says trade discounts, rebates and other similar items are deducted. Now he's very clear on the word trade discount. It is not a cash discount. It is supposed to be a trade discount. So as I said, I'm going to come back to this, but let me first focus on the second concept that is conversion cost. You, you know, as we just said, a conversion cost would mean basically what? It would mean that you're going to consider labor that is direct labor and you're going to consider overheads but remember production overheads what you call factory overheads or you can say manufacturing overheads we don't consider administration overheads we don't consider selling and distribution overheads a conversion cost would consider the factory what you call the production or what you call the manufacturing overheads and we consider the variable and the fixed production overheads both. So conversion cost would mean a total of three components. You would say a direct labor, you would say a variable factory overheads, and you would say a fixed factory overheads. Now why I want to concentrate on this particular concept is because when you go to consider the fixed overheads as a part of the inventory, we need to consider a recovery rate. Because if you go to the para number 13, the para number 13 very clearly says at the beginning, the allocation, allocation means the recovery. The allocation of fixed production overheads is based on a normal capacity of production facility. That means we calculate a recovery rate and you know that in cost accounting, we always consider a recovery rate based on the normal production levels. But there is something very interesting which comes out of para number 13. So I think in order to elaborate that before I read the para number 13, which I would later, I'm going to first of all, you know, make you something. I'm going to give you some inputs. Then I'm going to come back to para number 13, link those inputs to para number 13 and appreciate the larger paragraph. So let me do one thing. Let me, I think, come back. And let me take some examples to illustrate the concept further to you. Let me take a small little example to illustrate the concept to you. So I am looking at a third section now where we're looking at cost, but within the third section, this is not the notes right now. I'm just making a little background on the concept. Let's imagine that the company, let's imagine that the company has got, uh, let's say, a normal production. Let's say the company has got a normal production to the extent of 1 lakh units. And we're going to consider a total of three cases. Under the case number one, let me consider that my actual production let me consider my actual production also equal to the normal production that's a 1 lakh units itself. So there is no difference in terms of your normal outputs and in terms of your actual outputs. Now just for understanding point of view, let's do one thing. Let's make a T-shaped profit and loss account just to understand the larger concept. Let's say the company has got a fixed production overheads to the extent of 10 lakh. So I would have taken the fixed production overheads. Let me call them as factory overheads. This is to the extent of 10 lakhs, which is taken on the debit side. Now, if I were to ask you to calculate a recovery rate, 
I'm pretty sure everybody would easily calculate a recovery rate that 10 lakh is the total fixed overheads and if you divide it by the normal production, you get a recovery rate which is 10 rupees on a per unit basis. That's what we do in cost accounting. Then in order to calculate a recovery rate, you would divide your fixed factory overheads by a normal level of productions and get a recovery rate. Indus 2 tells me that when you go to consider the valuation of the closing stock, you would include the fixed overheads based on this recovery rate. So let's imagine on a very extreme level, let's say whatever 1 lakh units were produced, it is entirely unsold. Let's say I've not even sold a single unit. So 1 lakh units were produced during the year and let's say the entire 1 lakh units is lying in the closing stock. So can I say you would have included the fixed overheads by using a recovery rate. This is not the stock valuation in entirety. This is only the amount of fixed overheads included in the stock valuation. So we would have taken 1 lakh into 10, a total of 10 lakh rupees in the closing stock valuation. Now, if you see something very interesting, you would see that you've taken 10 lakhs on the debit side and you've taken 10 lakhs on the credit side. So the impact on profit is zero. So this is a very, you know, very, I would say, a wonderful situation where the normal productions and the actual productions are the same. You've achieved the same levels of production. Let's do one thing. Let's take another case number two. You know what I'm up to. And on that basis, I'm going to develop a concept as well. Now, let's imagine another situation where we're going to consider the actual production to be below the normal production. Let's say that the actual production is, let's say to the extent of 80,000 units. I'm keeping the normal production same, that's 1 lakh units, and considering an actual production to the extent of 80,000 units. Now, in this particular case, let me draw a profit and loss account again. So I would have taken my fixed factory overheads to the extent of 10 lakhs on the debit side and assuming the same concept that the entire production is unsold. So the entire 80,000 units is lying in the closing stock at the end of the year. So we've got a total of 80,000 units in the closing stock. And we would have taken the recovery rate at the rate of 10 rupees per unit. So which means that you would have taken a total of 8 lakhs. 8 lakh rupees would have been taken as a part of the inventory valuation. The fixed overheads would have included 8 lakhs. Now you can see it's again something very interesting indeed that out of 10 lakhs, only 8 lakhs is getting entered on the stock valuation. So you would get a balancing figure, which is a 2 lakh rupees of loss. And goodness, you can certainly see something. I am getting a loss even without a sale. I am getting a loss even without a sale. Is that logical enough that I am going to book a loss even without having a sale? Well, I think let me say something at this end. If the company is producing below the normal level of production, whose failure, whose fault is it? It is the company's fault. If you operate below the normal levels of production, then you got to suffer for that. Now, indirectly, if I use a little technical terms, I would say that out of 10 lakh, what you included in the inventory 8 lakh is called a product cost. And out of the 10 lakh, the 2 lakh rupees, which is not taken in the inventory valuation is called a period cost. So the company is going to get a loss on sale even without a sale. So that means we will not change the recovery rate in this case, of course not. If the company produces below normal level of production, let them suffer, let them book a period cost, which is two lakhs in my given example. Let's have a look at the case number three. And let me also tell you that indirectly, if you relate the case number two, you know, you could call this two lakh rupees. You can relate it that in cost accounting, you used to call that two lakh rupees as an under recovery. 
So what we're calling it as a period cost today in accounting is what we used to call an under recovery in terms of cost accounting. Let's take another case. Let's go to the case number three, where this time I'm going to enhance my actual production and I'm going to enhance my actual production more than the normal production. Let's say 1,20,000 units. Let's say I'm going to consider my actual production to be greater than normal production. So let's have a look further and let's again make a profit and loss account and look at some very interesting results to see. I would have taken my fixed factory overheads and that is to the extent of 10 lakh rupees. And assuming that the entire production of 1,20,000 is unsold at the end of the year and the recovery rate is 10 rupees per unit. So you would say that my closing stock is supposed to be 12 lakh. The closing stock will include the fixed factory overhead to the extent of 12 lakh rupees. And that would also give me something very funny in nature that you would get a total of 2 lakh rupees as a profit and good God, this is a profit without even a sale. You getting a profit of 2 lakh rupees and that is even without a sale as such. Now, is this logical? Now, this is going to become illogical. If the company produces more than the normal levels of production and I don't change a recovery rate, I would allow the company to book profits without sale. Now this will go against prudence. So what the Indus 2 did, in fact that was there in accounting standard 2 as well in IGAP, they said that if the company has got actual production which is more than the normal levels of production, then in this particular case what you need to do, you should rather change the recovery rate. You should rather change the recovery rate. So what we're going to do, we're going to change the recovery rate. We're going to change the recovery rate. So what are we going to do? We will divide that 10 lakh rupees, which is the fixed factory overheads by 1 lakh 20,000. And we will get a new recovery rate, which is 8.33 per unit. Once you change the recovery rate to 8.33 per unit, then this figure of 12 lakh will undergo a change and this will become 10 lakhs itself. And automatically the figure of profit would also disappear. So what is the model of the story? The model of the story is that if you look at all these three situations together, you can see something very interesting which is coming into flow. That if your actual and normal production is same, you consider the recovery rate based on normal production. Situation number two, if your actual and normal production is different, rather I would say the actual production is less, we still stick to the normal production. But if the actual production is more, then in that particular case we say change the recovery rate. And in fact, let me tell you that this two lakhs of profit which you're getting in case number three is what? It is indirectly over recovery. So if I were to also say a little technical way, two things to you, I would say a lot of people have the apprehension that end AS2 is based on absorption costing technique because we use a recovery rate for the purpose. But I would say it's not absorption costing actually. Because you're not sticking to the recovery rate in all three cases, I would rather call this that it is based on a modified absorption costing. I would technically say that it is based on a modified absorption costing. Which means that if I were to say that if I am calculating a recovery rate, if I am going to calculate a recovery rate, then I would say you would consider your fixed production or factory overheads and you can easily divide it by the normal production or I would say the actual production whichever is greater. You can take whichever is greater. This is how we can use a recovery rate. In the first case when the actual and normal is same you took 1 lakh. In the second case, when the actual is 80,000, you still took the greater of the two, that is 1 lakh. In the third case, when the actual is 120, you took 1 lakh 20,000, whichever is greater. 
So I would say the recovery rate, which is used in terms of India's two for measurement of inventory, is supposed to be based on a modified absorption costing. And if somebody were to ask me that what is the, you know, the formula for a recovery rate, if I'm applying a modified absorption costing, I would say that you need to divide your overheads by the normal or the actual production, whichever is greater. I think my discussion is going to be incomplete. If at this particular stage, I don't take you to the pattern number 13 and link these three cases there, then I think we shall be able to you know, appreciate the larger picture as well. Let's have a look at the parent number 30. It says the allocation of fixed production overheads to the cost of conversion is based on normal capacity. So at the very beginning, you know, he is indirectly telling you that we are using an absorption costing technique. That when you go to calculate a recovery rate, you go to calculate a recovery rate based on normal production. Then he defines, you know, what is normal. I'm skipping that, but I am coming out here. I'm coming to the word the. Remember the first case? Actual level of production may be used if it approximates the normal capacity. Actual level of production may be used if it approximates the normal capacity. The amount of, now look at the next one, the amount of fixed overheads allocated to each unit is not increased as a consequence of low production. Remember the second case when the production was below the normal level of production? We did not change the recovery rate. Now if you let's say recalculate a recovery rate based on low production, you would have divided 10 lakh by 80,000 and we would have got a recovery rate of 12.5. But he very clearly prohibits you that the fixed overheads is not increased. You're not going to change the recovery rate as a consequence of low production, the unallocated overheads. Remember the unallocated overheads was the under recovery, the two lakhs in my example is recognized as an expense in the period in which it is incurred. Now, when I say it is taken as an expense in the period in which it is incurred, it is indirectly saying that we are considering that to be a period cost. So if you remember that out of 10 lakh rupees, we said indirectly 8 lakh is a product cost and 2 lakh is supposed to be a period cost. And then he further adds on as a third example, in periods of abnormally high production, that's like the third case, where your actual production is more than the normal levels of production. So it says in periods of abnormally high production, the fixed overheads allocated to each unit is decreased. And if you remember, I changed the recovery rate from 10 rupees to 8.33 per unit. So that the inventory is not measured above cost. Because if the inventory is going to be measured above cost, you are going to get artificial profits without even say. So the parent number 13 is actually, you know, devoted to the concept what we discussed with you, that when you're considering a recovery rate for the fixed factory overheads, you need to consider the recovery rate based on the normal or actual production, whichever is greater. So as I said, I'm going to first do a little discussion on the conversion cost video. Then I think we're going to come back to the paragraphs as well. Now, let me, I think, also go back to the standard and give you something more interesting inputs. And then we're going to make some notes on that as well. You know, when I was looking in terms of the para number 15, sorry, para number 10, it very clearly said that the cost is going to comprise of three main things. One is a cost of purchase, one is a conversion cost, and one is the other cost, which is incurred in bringing the inventory to present location and condition. So I get in my mind, you know, a framework that there are three things to be taken. One is a cost of purchase. 
Number two, a conversion cost. And number three, other cost. Now, as we went along the cost of purchase, it gave a clarification that what is included. We said a purchase price, import duty, other taxes provided it is not recoverable from the taxing authority, the transport, the handling cost, and other directly attributable, as I said, loading and loading charges, less any trade discount. Then in terms of conversion cost, we have now clearly seen a direct labor, a variable factory overheads and direct labor and variable factory overheads will be taken on the basis of whatever is the actual cost per unit because they're variable cost, but fixed overheads will be taken on the basis of the recovery rate, what we decided. Then there is an other cost and you know, if you look at the other cost in terms of other cost, it uses the word that cost which is necessary to bring it to present location and condition. The key terms is location and the key term is condition. Location means the place from where the final dispatch of the goods is going to take place. Let's imagine, let's say I have a factory in the outskirts of the city. So I have a factory in the outskirts of the city, but my go down is let's say within the city. So I need to incur a transportation cost from bringing the inventory from the factory premises to the place of go down. Would this cost be included in the measurement of inventory considering that it is to bring it to the location? Yes. Location means the place from where the final dispatch of the goods is going to be done to the consumer. And as far as the word condition is concerned, the word condition means the condition of sale. Any cost which we're going to incur to bring it into a saleable condition is going to be considered as a part of the inventory. So for example, let's say for example, a company is, let's say, going to incur a designing cost for the customer because the customer says I want a particular design of the product. So whatever cost of designing I have incurred, I need to add that because it is necessary to bring it into the condition of sale. And if you notice in panel number 15, we give the same example. It says it may be appropriate to include, for example, the cost of designing the product for specific customers in the cost of the inventory. Now then there is another very interesting inputs given in the standard and it talks of the para number 16 where it says that these are examples which are not taken. You know, if I were to make a framework in the mind in terms of what is included in the cost or what is not included in the cost, I would also use certain technical terms and I would say that if you're considering what is included in the inventory, that cost of purchase, that conversion cost, another cost, they're all product cost. And what is not included in the inventory, what is given in para number 16 is what you call a period cost. And if you read the, the para number 16, it very clearly says the examples of cost that are recognized as an expense in the period in which it is incurred. And he gives you examples, abnormal wastage, storage cost, unless it is a necessary part of the production stage. And, you know, if you look at certain industries, like, for example, a wine manufacturer, storage is something which is a necessary part of the production process. You need a fermentation. And for that particular case, the storage is a necessary prerequisite of the production process. Then the storage cost is a part of the inventory. But if you store the inventory after it is already manufactured, then it cannot be taken into account. Administration overheads are not taken. Selling cost, which I already said, is not taken. Now there is something further interesting in terms of Para 17, where it talks of one is a list which is included called a product cost. One is a list which is excluded called a period cost. And then I would say there is a third cost which may or may not be included. So what do you mean by may or may not be included? It all depends upon the facts of the case. Para number 17 tells me that 
Indus 23, which deals with borrowing cost under limited circumstances, tells me when borrowing cost will be included. If your inventory is a qualifying asset, if your inventory is a qualifying asset, then the borrowing cost is included in the inventory valuation. But if your inventory is not a qualifying asset, then the borrowing cost cannot be included. So I would say that when you look at the concept of cost, your mind should work on a three set framework. What is included? One list. What is excluded? Another list. And what may or may not be included is like a third list with which, you know, we can easily crack on the questions. I think let's do one thing now. Let's make some documented notes on this concept as well. So I'm now going to make notes on my third section where I want to make notes on what is included, excluded, or may or may not be included, excluded. So we're going to work upon that. So, we're going to make a chart where we're going to say cost. And I think we can divide this cost in terms of three parts. One is we can say what is included. And in the brackets for your ease of understanding, we can call this as a product cost. So, can we use this term in the exam as well? Undoubtedly, yes. And then there is another thing which we will say is excluded. And that is what we technically call a period cost. And then there is a cost which may or may not be included. It may or may not be included. It all depends upon the facts of the case. So let's, I think, zero down on each and every cost with us. So I think when we're looking in terms of what is included, we decided that we've got basically three kinds of cost, which is to be included. One is we said it's a purchase cost. One is we said it's a conversion cost. And the third cost is what we said it's other cost. So I said when we are considering the concept of the purchase cost, then our mind is working on that we will consider number one a purchase price. Number two, we're going to consider any import duties which might have been paid, especially when your inventory is, let's say, imported. Then we could look at another cost number three, and that is in terms of other taxes. But I think it's important to put in the brackets which are not recoverable. Because as I said, if there is a GST, then we're not going to consider that amount if we've got an input credit on the same. And then we also said there could be some cost which is let's say directly attributable so purchase price import duty other taxes and any let's say transport cost let's put it like this there is a transport cost let's say we've got handling cost so these are all the inputs given and further we can also put out here less the trade discount so we're talking about the trade discount. We're not looking at the cash discount. So we can also put in the brackets, not cash discount. Because sometimes the examiner could test a knowledge that they know that we need to reduce a trade discount and not a cash discount. Similarly, when we're looking in terms of the conversion cost, we're looking in terms of conversion cost, the direct labor. We're looking in terms of the variable factory overheads. And we're looking in terms of the fixed factory overheads. And you need to remember that when you go to consider the fixed factory overheads, I just gave you that we're going to use a recovery rate for the purpose. And the recovery rate for the purpose is going to be based on, it'll be based on normal or actual production. 
it is going to be based on the normal or actual production whichever is greater so we need to keep in mind that we could consider the recovery rate based on whichever is greater and then we consider what is other cost we said other cost that whatever is incurred to bring it to the location that's one keyword and to bring it to the condition that's another keyword location means what from where location means from where final dispatch will take place from where final dispatch will take place so wherever is the place from where the consumers will be delivered the goods so we need to bring it at that particular location from where the final dispatch of the goods is going to take place and when you're looking in terms of condition the word condition means condition of sale to bring it into a saleable condition similarly if we go back and we say that what is excluded we can say the exclusions is in terms of abnormal wastage the exclusion would be in terms of abnormal wastage that's one we're also looking at the exclusions in terms of storage cost unless it is a necessary part of the production process then we said the administration overheads then we said the selling and distribution overheads though if you look at the language of the standard it says selling cost but selling cost would mean selling and distribution overheads both and when we say it may or may not be included then we're looking at the boring cost and we said it all depends upon whether the inventory is a qualifying asset if it is a qualifying asset it is included and if it is not a qualifying asset then it is excluded so you will have to see whether the inventory is a qualifying asset or not and accordingly one would zero down whether it is to be taken or not so i think we've made a complete concept in terms of things that what cost is included or excluded sir any question on that yes i think i'm now going to take you to a question on that as well so let me bring you to another question on this area in terms of what is included or what is not included in terms of cost the question number 4 as you can see is very clearly says is based on para number 10 to para number 13 this is a question in the study mat and i think we can easily decide what is to be added what is to be deducted or what is to be excluded so we will have three kind of answers included excluded or we will say maybe it is deducted as well He says a company purchases car from several countries and sells them to Asian country. During the current year, the company is incurred the following expense. It says trade discount deducted. It says handling cost relating to imports directly attributable included. Salaries of the accounting department is an administrative cost excluded. sales commission paid to the sales agent is selling and distribution excluded after sales warranty cost is again excluded import duties cost of purchase included then it says the cost of purchase is based on supplier's invoice of course the cost of purchase is taken freight included insurance on the purchase again directly attributable included and the brokerage commission which is paid to the intending agents and that is supposed to be again something which is directly attributable included so are we going to get questions of this sort in the exam well i don't think so this is only to you know get the picture more clear get a little more greater understanding of the concept So I guess friends the first phase of my discussion gets over on that the standard is not complete but we are done with the part number 1 were basically today I've made an exposure to you in terms of the definition of inventory that's one 
the measurement principles in terms of parent number 9 and 32 and then we went on to what is cost what is included what is excluded what may or may not be included in terms of inventory we'll be continuing this discussion further where we're going to go on to certain special issues related to cost where we'll discuss joint and by products where we're going to discuss the concept of deficit credits and we're going to discuss the cost formulas then we're going to come back to the discussions on the nrv so please do revise whatever we have done so i'm going to see you again till then take care goodbye and thank you